Letter two of the Shirley Letters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shirley Letters from California Mines in eighteen fifty one and fifty two by Dame Shirley. Louise Amelia Knapp Smith Clapp. Letter the second. Rich Bar, its hotels and pioneer families. Rich Bar, East Branch of the North Fork of Feather River, September fifteenth, eighteen fifty one. I believe that I closed my last letter by informing you that I was safely ensconced, after all the hair breadth escapes of my wearisome, though at the same time delightful, journey, under the magnificent roof of the Empire, which, by the way, is the hotel of the place. Not but that nearly every other shanty on the bar claims the same grandiloquent title. Indeed, for that matter, California herself might be called the Hotel State, so completely is she inundated with taverns, boarding-houses, etc. The Empire is the only two-story building in town, and absolutely has a live upstairs. Here you will find two or three glass windows, an unknown luxury in all the other dwellings. It is built of planks of the roughest possible description. The roof, of course, is covered with canvas, which also forms the entire front of the house, on which is painted, in immense capitals, the following imposing letters, THE EMPIRE. I will describe, as exactly as possible, this grand establishment. You first enter a large apartment, level with the street, part of which is fitted up as a bar-room, with that eternal crimson calico which flushes the whole social life of the Golden State with its everlasting red, in the centre of a fluted mass of which gleams a really elegant mirror, set off by a background of decanters, cigar-vases, and jars of brandied fruit, the whole forming a tout ensemble of dazzling splendour. A table covered with a green cloth, upon which lies a pack of monte cards, a backgammon board, and a sickening pile of yellow-covered literature, with several uncomfortable-looking benches, complete the furniture of this most important portion of such a place as the Empire. The remainder of the room does duty as a shop, where velveteen and leather, flannel shirts and calico ditto, the latter starched to an appalling state of stiffness, lie cheek by jowl with hams, preserved meats, oysters, and other groceries, in hopeless confusion. From the bar-room you ascend by four steps into the parlour, the floor of which is covered by a straw carpet. This room contains quite a decent-looking glass, a sofa fourteen feet long and a foot and a half wide, painfully suggestive of an aching back, of course covered with red calico, the sofa, not the back. A round table with a green cloth, six cane-bottomed chairs, red calico curtains, a cooking-stove, a rocking-chair, and a woman and a baby, of whom more anon, the latter wearing a scarlet frock to match the sofa and curtains. A flight of four steps leads from the parlour to the upper story, where, on each side of a narrow entry, are four eight feet by ten bedrooms, the floors of which are covered by straw matting. Here your eyes are again refreshed with a glittering vision of red calico curtains, gracefully festooned above wooden windows, picturesquely lattice-like. These tiny chambers are furnished with little tables covered with oilcloth, and bedsteads so heavy that nothing short of a giant's strength could move them. Indeed, I am convinced that they were built, piece by piece, on the spot where they now stand. The entire building is lined with purple calico, alternating with a delicate blue, and the effect is really quite pretty. The floors are so very uneven that you are always ascending a hill or descending into a valley. The doors consist of a slight frame covered with dark blue drilling, and are hung on hinges of leather. As to the kitchen and dining-room, I leave to your vivid imagination to picture their primitiveness, merely observing that nothing was ever more awkward and unworkmanlike than the whole tenement. It is just such a piece of carpentering as a child two years old, gifted with the strength of a man, would produce if it wanted to play at making grown-up houses. And yet this impertinent apology for a house cost its original owners more than eight thousand dollars. This will not be quite so surprising when I inform you that, at the time it was built, everything had to be packed from Marysville at a cost of forty cents a pound. Compare this with the price of freight on the railroads at home, and you will easily make an estimate of the immense outlay of money necessary to collect the materials for such an undertaking at Rich Bar. It was built by a company of gamblers as a residence for two of those unfortunates who make a trade, 
a thing of barter, of the holiest passion, when sanctified by love, that ever thrills the wayward heart of poor humanity. To the lasting honour of miners, be it written, the speculation proved a decided failure. Yes, these thousand men, many of whom had been for years absent from the softening amenities of female society, and the sweet restraining influences of pure womanhood, these husbands of fair young wives kneeling daily at the altars of their holy homes to pray for their far-off ones, these sons of grey-haired mothers, majestic in their sanctified old age, these brothers of virginal sisters, white and saint-like as the lilies of their own gardens, looked only with contempt or pity on these, oh, so earnestly to be compassioned creatures. These unhappy members of a class, to one of which the tenderest words that Jesus ever spake were uttered, left in a few weeks absolutely driven away by public opinion. The disappointed gamblers sold the house to its present proprietor for a few hundred dollars. Mr. B., the landlord of the Empire, was a western farmer who with his wife crossed the plains about two years ago. Immediately on his arrival he settled at a mining station, where he remained until last spring, when he removed to Rich Bar. Mrs. B. is a gentle and amiable-looking woman, about twenty-five years of age. She is an example of the terrible wear and tear to the complexion in crossing the plains, hers having become, through exposure at that time, of a dark and permanent yellow, anything but becoming. I will give you a key to her character, which will exhibit it better than weeks of description. She took a nursing babe, eight months old, from her bosom, and left it with two other children, almost infants, to cross the plains in search of gold. When I arrived she was cooking supper for some half a dozen people, while her really pretty boy, who lay kicking furiously in his champagne-basket cradle, and screaming with a six-month-old baby power, had, that day, completed just two weeks of his earthly pilgrimage. The inconvenience which she suffered during what George Sand calls the sublime martyrdom of maternity would appall the wife of the humblest pauper of a New England village. Another woman, also from the West, was with her at the time of her infant's birth, but scarcely had the latest found given the first characteristic shriek of its debut upon the stage of life, when this person herself was taken seriously ill, and was obliged to return to her own cabin, leaving the poor exhausted mother entirely alone. Her husband lay seriously sick himself at the time, and of course could offer her no assistance. A miner, who lived in the house, and hoarded himself, carried her some bread and tea in the morning and evening, and that was all the care she had. Two days after its birth she made a desperate effort, and, by easy stages of ten minutes at a time, contrived to get poor baby washed and dressed, after a fashion. He is an astonishingly large and strong child, holds his head up like a six-monther, and has but one failing, a too evident and officious desire to inform everybody far and near, at all hours of the night and day, that his lungs are in a perfectly sound and healthy condition, a piece of intelligence which, though very gratifying, is rather inconvenient if one happens to be particularly sleepy. Besides Mrs. B., there are three other women on the bar. One is called the Indiana Girl, from the name of her Pa's Hotel, though it must be confessed that the sweet name of Girl seems sadly incongruous when applied to such a gigantic piece of humanity. I have a great desire to see her, which will probably not be gratified, as she leaves in a few days for the valley. But, at any rate, I can say that I have heard her, the far-off roll of her mighty voice, booming through two closed doors and a long entry, added greatly to the severe attack of nervous headache under which I was suffering when she called. This gentle creature wears the thickest kind of miner's boots, and has the dainty habit of wiping the dishes on her apron. Last spring she walked to this place, and packed fifty pounds of flour on her back down that awful hill, the snow being five feet deep at the time. Mr. and Mrs. B., who have three pretty children, reside in a log cabin at the entrance of the village. One of the little girls was in the bar-room to-day, and her sweet and bird-like voice brought tearfully, and yet joyfully, to my memory, Tearsoul, Lely, and Lyle Katy. Mrs. B., who is as small as the Indiana girl, is large, indeed I have been confidently informed that she weighs but sixty-eight pounds, keeps, with her husband, the miner's home. Mem, the Lady Tens Bar. Voila, my dear, the female population of my new home. 
Splendid material for social parties this winter, are they not? End of letter two. Recorded by Rachel Allen, February second, two thousand eight, in Yosemite, California.